decolonize your bookshelf in 50 books with Professor Joan Anim Addo, Dr. Deirdre Osborne, and Khadija Sese as part of the Glen Ira Storytelling Festival in Nam or Melbourne. My name is Inga Simpson. I'm an Australian author and nature writer with a background in literary studies. So I've relished reading This is the Canon, and I'm really excited about this conversation. Before I introduce our authors properly, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Walbunya country, part of Ewan Nation on the south coast of New South Wales, land never ceded. And Glen Ira City Council acknowledges the Boonwurrung and Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation as traditional custodians and our original storytellers and pay their respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and uphold their ongoing relationship to land and waterways and extend our respects to all First Nations people in our audience. So we're going to have a conversation ab about the book. This is the canon, the process for bringing it into the world, what is meant by the canon, and why a book like this is so necessary. If you're watching, you can message your questions as we go along, and I'll be able to put some of those at least to our authors towards the end of the session if we haven't answered them already. So to introduce our writers, Professor Joan Anim Addo was born in Granada. She's an author, librettist, poet, literary critic and historian, and the UK's first black professor of literature. In 2014, she co-founded the MA in Masters of Arts, Master of Arts in Black British Writing with Dr. Deirdre Osborne, who we'll meet in a moment, as well as the MA in Creative Life, Creative and Life Writing at Goldsmiths London. She's taught and lectured in universities around the world and is associate editor of Kalalu, Journal of Africa, Diaspora Arts and Letters, and co-editor of Black Lines, the Journal of Black British Writing. She also founded Mango Publishing to bring a more diverse range of new writing to readers internationally. Her published works include Imoinda, or She Who Will Lose Her Name, the poetry collections Haunted by History and Janie Cricketing Lady, I might have to ask about that later, and the literary history Touching the Body, History, Language and African Caribbean Women's Writing. Dr Deirdre Osborne grew up on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, the traditional custodians, and uh, her undergraduate, I believe, um, university education began in Melbourne. Um, she's a reader in English literature and drama at Goldsmiths London, where she co-founded the MA in Black British Writing with Joan, and she was the editor of the 2016 Cambridge Companion to British Black Literature, 1945 to 2010. And she's the author of over 50 articles and book chapters, as well as editing collections of numerous, um, editing numerous collections dedicated to black writers. She's also associate editor of Women's Writing Journal. Khadija Sese is a literary activist, short story writer, and poet of Sierra Leonean descent who works in literary project management and creative professional development with adults and young people. From 2001 to 2015, she published Sable, literary magazine for emerging writers of colour. Her published works include the poetry collection Erki and the forthcoming collection The Modern Pan-Africanist's Journey. Her doctoral research is in Black British Publishing and Pan-Africanism at Brighton University. Khadija's work has earned her many awards and nominations, including the Cosmopolitan Woman of Achievement, the Voice Community Award in Literature, the Millennium Woman of the Year, and an MBE for her services to literature. Thank you uh, and welcome. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I thought we should start by hearing where the idea for the book came from and how you all end up, ended up working together on it. We always defer to Joan to start us off. <laughs> Thanks, <Hi>. Joan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the idea of this book actually came from the publisher. Um, they were very interested and uh, met up with Deirdre and myself, who uh, were at the time working together uh, and had a conversation about the possibility of this work, which would 
uh, draw people's attention to um, what we're usually expected to read and to actually broadening out to diversifying our, our reading, particularly focusing on the idea of decolonizing. So, Deirdre. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> um, yes, one of the powerful ways that we believe for decolonizing is to work collaboratively. And of course, we could only select 50 books out of millions, perhaps. <laughs> and it was a very, very uh, large task to do this. And so it was needed, a third woman was needed. And so we have, um, we were invited, uh, we invited Khadija to join us, because I think each of us have completely distinct profiles, even though we have shared interests in our sort of literary activism and our um, desire to get people to read the works as much as possible. So Khadija, your thoughts on joining the triumvirate? <laughs> Yeah, um, I was really honoured to be asked to do something like this. It came at the most inopportune time for me because I was just about to submit my my thesis for my doctorate. But I just thought, hey, <laughs> it will work out. It will get done because this is something I cannot turn down. Um, and I was just hoping that some of the books that I thought should be in there were there, which they were. But then I also... They were also really nice and they let me like drag them through the mire again to say, I think we need to select some others. And it was funny that some of the ones that I really wanted to see there, they had already thought about anyway. It was just that they had to narrow the selection. Um, you know, so we were, as, as Deirdre said, we were kind of like, even though we had before we'd even spoken about it, we were really all on the similar kind of page of the kind of books that should be in there. We just didn't know how to fit them in there. And we're not mathematical nor geniuses <laughs> to expand 50 to 100, which we really wanted to do. So we still had to, you know, we rethink and we narrow and just, you know, and, and with balance as well, again, in terms of the different regions we were covering, the 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 time scale, um, gender, etc. So yeah, it was it was it was, diff it was difficult, but I think we achieved something really good at the end of it. Oh, I agree absolutely. Uh, why the time frame that you chose? What was the thinking behind that? I suppose because the one seismic event that united in a horrible way most of the world was the Second World War, and so. What that caused as a result was a huge displacement of people never seen on a global scale. And the way in which literature that emerged out of, especially the, the fallen British empire and the kind of dynamics of decolonization and the assertion of uh, national independences out of that framework, that meant that it was a sort of opportune time to start off as a springboard into now. And, and it was a sort of a, a kind of quite common shared period of history as a launch pad. I hope that's yeah. fair to say, Joan and Khadija. Yeah. Yes, it, we didn't we didn't fight about the, the timeline. So I th I think that <laughs> that worked. But it's also uh the the constraints of 50 books, that constraint was real. And so we were we were happy to find ways <laughs> to um, to organize those 50 books and starting there uh, seemed well it helped us enormously to be clear-headed about where we were the direction we were going in so did you fight about anything any of the inclusions or exclusions we only fought very nicely <laughs> <laughs> there was no blood <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was the nice bit there was no blood <laughs> It sounds like it was tough to narrow it down to 50. Maybe there's room for another 50 um, in a follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. In some reasons, that's why we have, if you like this, try this section. No, I love um, that. Yeah. Yeah, so did we. And that was one way of kind of overcoming that, and that was some way that we were able to let go because some of those books may be like a fairly new books, but they would reflect on some of the topics of themes that came out in one of the 50. So maybe they wouldn't have all have necessarily been part of the 50, but we just felt that there was enough scope there to be able to, um, a, 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 you know, encourage and, and, and introduce people to other works, you know, but definitely there would have, when you think about it, the, the, the regions and the peoples that we were covering, there were definitely going to be more than 50, you know, yeah. um, absolutely and and the more that we worked on it 
the, the more people we wanted to include in the yeah. if you like this try this section so again yeah. that was a balancing act because we yeah. could have included double that number in that section as well quite easily yeah absolutely and i love that if you like this try and um, there's a lot of quite contemporary indigenous works mentioned in there which is great and it sort of helps contextualize contextualize the book being discussed with works from different nations and and time periods and um those connections are lovely you know uh, really rich um you mentioned joan um in in this book the books that are included in in this is the canon might not be what people would normally find on their university um, reading list or their local book club. So perhaps we should unpack a little bit what is you know meant by the canon and what it's come to represent uh, and how do you go about decolonizing uh, the canon or even your own bookshelf or a reading list for um, for a unit and a university course. I mean where do we start? It's probably as well, I think, for us to start with the kind, what we've learned over the years during the process of being educated. And during that process, we have learned about uh, some, some kind of notion of classical. This is, this you must read. This is important. You're not educated unless you've read certain figures. And those figures have been, by and large, the same figures that each generation is told. You really must read this. And that's fine, but it's, it's not enough because that pool largely uh, takes from um, uh, colonial, uh, colonial thinking. So uh, what we wanted was the range to get people who have maybe uh, not had the opportunity to be guided through the range. We, we wanted to be able to put some, some signposts up so that um, there can be the same kind of, conf or not the same kind, but a similar confidence about choosing uh, a book that they've not been given very much information about um, up until this point, so that there is an awareness of a range, there is a sense of um, uh, material that will help to guide people towards that range. And it's amazing how rigid the canonization has been, especially in education, because I always give the example that the uh, A-levels or matriculation curriculum I studied in Australia 40 years later in London, my daughter studied an almost identical curriculum. <laughs> and that was so indicative of especially the relationship between Britain and its uh, former colonial and still colonised, it's still a colonial country, Australia, the way in which that is absolutely solidified through the literary exposure that children have to work. And um, one of the wonderful things I think is that we've brought in the Pacific region into dialogue with the Indian and Atlantic Ocean regions to see what the works are that come out of that region say to each other when they're brought into proximity. And it is especially noticeable always to me that Indigenous writing from Australia just does not get re read regularly in Britain. It's as mm. though that's a blank spot or a blind spot, one reach too far across the world mm. in terms of reconceiving of the canon. And for me, it's a joy every time I go back to Australia, I can buy books or I'm kindly sent books by friends uh, by Australian Indigenous writers. And I think it's very important, therefore, that we, we bring all of these sort of areas of the world into dialogue to, to reshape the canon. Um, absolutely. And there's so many Indigenous writers being published here in Australia at the moment. Um, why is it sometimes, why is what's in the bookstore um, ahead of what's on a curriculum? <laughs> That's that's an excellent question, isn't it? Um, again, I, I think those of us teaching in the university system 
I have to take some responsibility for uh, that narrowness. And university lecturers often decry uh, a, a, an observation that students are perhaps resistant to the canonical material that they want to teach. But, but at the same time, uh, I think we have to take note that students do want to find out about the world in which they live this moment. You know, it's all very well though, uh, reading about uh, established material, but what about understanding the dynamics uh, of what is happening now, which of course, uh, literature doesn't set out to teach us, but it does teach us. And, and, uh, and I think, yes, we um, generally are responsible within literature departments and within um, some parts of the media, I think, uh, which sees th themselves as reflecting this uh, terribly um, important uh, material that is, that is removed from most people's understanding of real life at the moment. I don't, mm. does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's a lack of confidence, particularly in young teachers, um, in teaching works from writers of colour? Yeah, I mean... Well, I, um, I was just going to say, on the MA that Joan and I co-founded, we have a number of uh, black literature secondary school teachers who do the degree part-time in order to flex their curriculum as much as they can with these works. But the problem is the curriculum is state set, government set. And so it has to happen in the most inventive ways and it has to happen often as extracurricular moments. So it goes back to the heart of, yes, there is the desire amongst teachers to actually respond to the heritages of the, the pupils and students they teach, but quite often it's the bureaucratic restraints that work with the sort of idea of what should be taught, um, even though there is the, the desire to change that. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny, isn't it? Because it's nowhere more important perhaps than in, in our young people to, you know, to be exposed to this diverse range of voices and it's sort of the slowest area to change. Um, you know, as a, a queer person growing up in rural Australia in the 70s and 80s, you know, I can um, appreciate, you know, how important it is for every person to see themselves reflected on the page in, in literature. And, you know, an absence is one thing. I'm thinking of the Australian literary canon here, but, you know, an absence is one thing, but then there's also the um, portrayals of um, Indigenous characters in Australian literature that are in the canon, you know, that were, were negative or stereotypical at, at the very least, you know. So, it, again, it's this um, slow movement, you know, to, to push some of that off the table and, and get that um, diverse range in. You know, what sort of um, changes have you you've noticed in the, in, I don't know, so the last five and ten years, you know, is that changing more rapidly, like what's available in the bookstore seems to have changed quite rapidly in the last five years. But yeah, is that reflected elsewhere? Khadija, take us forward. <laughs> um, well, I know I, I wasn't sure, but like, I think I was talking about like, well, maybe what's changed in, in, you know, in terms of teaching and, but I only really, I don't, I don't do a lot of teaching. I only do one, like one. Oops. Oh, oh. Oh dear! Um, no, she's back. What? Well, you, fro you froze for a minute. Oh, you froze oh for okay. A minute. <laughs> yeah. I don't know yeah. what you heard. Anyway, so um, what I—I I mean, I have noticed in where I, I mainly like teach extracurricular, but mainly, um, yeah, I teach mainly extracurricular in terms of extracurricular ways. And at least I hear that once once you introduce something to young people, and I'll be you know working with kids from like about from twelve year olds upwards. They really want to know more, you know, and if I'm doing like extracurricular with, with some university students, particularly around the publishing side of things, they want to know why haven't we already, why haven't we told this? Why isn't this available to us? 
you know, you're, you're just showing us and we're just kind of doing this as something extracurricular in a very short course. Why, why don't we get this? Or, you know, I've been, and when I hear sometimes what they've been teaching, oh yes, and in poetry, I, I had this writer and I had that writer. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you know, and, and, and I kind of get upset like I'm working with the, you know, young black writers and they've never even read one black poet in, in school. It's really upsetting, and I don't want to kind of go in and say, "Well, there's something wrong there with your with your school or your teacher." But then I just have to kind of introduce it in a really kind way to say it is there, and you can do some of your own for yourself if, if it need be, you know. And that's something that we hope with this book that we're democratizing the canon. That that sort of groundswell is going to come from people's personal mm-hmm. reading, and mm-hmm. the tastes that are developed as a result of to use that word, diversifying um, what is possible to read and and to sort of alter reading habits. And as you said, Inga, bookshelves in perhaps bookshops are changing um, and showing more scope than ever before in certain parts of the world. Uh, And so if it's led by the sort of sense of popularising reading, that, that is a way, I think, that might lead to an eventual positive change. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you mentioned the idea of guiding the reader, you know, and this book does that, giving the context um, for, for each of the books and a kind of a, a critique as, um, as well as the storyline, the characters and so on. It's a way in for, you know, any any reader, uh, I think. It's a lovely way in. You, and there's a lovely introduction that sets up the idea of the book and kind of deconstructs ideas of the canon and so on. You know, it, it really, yeah, it is giving everyone the tools um, to have a, a self-guided tour um, of, the, of this, these 50 books of this canon, you know, thanks to the work you've done. Um, there's a lovely idea in your introduction as well about learning how to read differently, learning, you know, for us as readers, learning how to read outside of uh, the books that we were given as kids or at university or in our book clubs, you know, the books set on those lists. What can you explain what you mean like for by that, um, for those listening who might not have read the book yet? You know, how how do we need to learn to read differently? I'm, I'm looking... <laughs> <laughs> uh, how how do how do we learn to read differently? I think if we go back to to your earlier point about the way in which we find ourselves on the page or not, uh, a a key way of reading differently is by searching for that self on the page and going out and asking and looking for where we might find the, the person who looks like us, the person, I mean, particularly the the person who is like us and noting that absence and trying to find out where we're gonna find those. So actually we have have lots of readers. We have a lot more readers than those of us in established places of teaching imagine because there are a lot of readers are saying, we don't like the stuff you, you offer to us, but we're finding our own where, where we're reflected on the page. And that is more important. Therefore, we will tell you we don't like reading, but we're actually readers. So in a way, our appeal is initially to those people who have begun that process. And after that, this is a kind of guide to a widening of this because if you haven't begun that process you're not going to be in that interested in reading anyway so we're, we're saying we know your readers now have a look at the range that is possible yeah and also reading is about in a way inhabiting the mind and voice of another and the, the text directs you as to how quite often 
you need to speak with the character because of the way the character speaks on the page. And I was just thinking of two examples, The Swan Book by Alexis Wright and The Emperor's Babe by Bernadine Evaristo. They have such distinctive narrative techniques and styles and voices and a really incredible poetic musicality with the way their texts are put together. And so to look at how we inhabit Zulika, who's the protagonist of The Emperor's Babe, an Afro-Romano um, girl, and we follow her incredible life. It's like a sort of a shooting star. And we are only inside her mind. And then, of course, with the Swan Book, um, to be inside the mind of an Indigenous girl who is actually mute because of trauma and the way in which the landscape of both books draws on Latin as a vital part of its language. And we remember that Latin is 80% of the roots of the English language. And so there's all this kind of layering that we can find when we sort of think about how we're reading as well in terms of what the language is we're reading in. Yeah, I wanted to ask about language, um, and it's lovely that this one book is in there. It's funny, it was published in 2013, I think, but it only seems to get more relevant, that book. Mm -hmm. um, her use of Indigenous language in, in the book, as well as Latin and French and English, I think, is really interesting. And um, in Australia, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot more books by Indigenous writers um, featuring language, um, Wiradjuri, for example, Tara June Winch's uh, most recent book that won the Miles Franklin, you know, it's actually got a Wiradjuri dictionary in it as a character, you know, it's pretty mm. far out. Um, mm. I couldn't have conceived of it 10, 10 years ago, you know, and I didn't, she did, but I couldn't have imagined <laughs> it being published 10 years ago. It is, it wins the Miles Franklin. How important is language in this decolonization process? <laughs> It is very, very important. Um, and, uh, if I can speak from the position of the Caribbean, for example, uh, language, language, the, the colonial languages have been a problem. Um, and how to integrate uh, colonial languages with the language, with popular languages, uh, the, that, that is the language of the people, um, many of which were banned, were, were not considered uh, language or the language of education or the language of art or, or whatever. So integrating the languages, that's been a huge problem. And certainly uh, for many writers, the way in which language is used um, has been very important because, in a way, of its novelty, right? The, the, there's not been a moment when people have had to forge this new literary language that is a mixture of languages. So from the Caribbean, for example, the Creole language is very important and it's, it, it's had to be fought for in order for it to be recognized as a literary language. So language is tremendously important. Uh, we, we forget, don't we, that, that is the material of books. Yeah. That's the material of writing. That is what, uh, that is the, the kind of plastic material that writers are, are obliged to use. So just tremendously important. So uh, I was going to just say, Patricia Grace, uh, her writing, Unglossed Maori, meant that Maori was then restored as the national language. Um, and so it, it is very important what a book can do in terms of bringing in those suppressed languages. So it's a reclaiming of sorts um, and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of renaming going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're now saying Nam instead of uh, Melbourne, you know, and that, that's going on all over the country. Um, yeah, great. Uh, and there's a, another Australian writer in there, um, Tony Birch, is the white girl. Did you want to talk to that inclusion, maybe, Deirdre? Yes, well, this is a really profound book. I mean, the books throughout the entire 50 are in, in many different ways. Um, Tony was 
in London and came to speak about this work at Goldsmiths. It was wonderful. It was a, a great honour, as well as speaking about his work in terms of um, Indigenous sovereignty, activism, climate justice, and so on as well. So I think this book illustrates uh, very uh, beautifully the situation that is an really relatively unknown story in perhaps the Northern Hemisphere about the, uh, the seismic changes that arose out of genocidal policies that um, still today finding kinship, finding those sorts of ruptured ties and putting those at the forefront of existing in the world um, in, in harmony um, that's, that's something that's a real illustration, I think, for people in a European location to read about. And, and that brings us into, I suppose, the idea of the location often in which you encounter these works is everything. Um, what we don't encounter because, say, for example, they're not translated into English. Our book had to work with books that were translated into English. And I know that Khadija's work in um, working with uh, authors from the African continent, um, that she has a lot of um, uh, sort of material that she can talk about in relation to that, um, Khadija. I know that you loved Albert Wendt's work, for example, the Samoan writer. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's sort of like on a different tip, I think, from in terms <laughs> of the um, African, um, in terms of the African writers. But um, and now I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I liked Albert Wendt in terms of that for a different reason. It's from a, from a Pacific writer I hadn't really come across before, but in terms of writing, in terms of um, reading from a writing, a writer's perspective, that was really, um, that was, that really opened up a lot for, for me personally. And that's what something I wanted to share. And I think the same, a similar kind of things in terms of with, you know, with African writers, uh, in terms of how learning learning to read and touching again on what Joan said in terms of the language, that's all coming into it because, you know, so many African people are multilingual anyway, you know, and so I just encourage them to use that in their, in their work if possible. Absolutely. Um, and translation is an interesting issue. I mean, I, kept, I keep talking about bookshops and how great they are and they've got all these books mm -hmm. in them. But, of course, there are plenty of books that are not available in English. And like most Australians, I only read in English. Um, you know, I have friends in Europe who read, read in three or four languages. But, um, yeah, what is the role of translation in, you know, in limiting access to, to books? And who are the gatekeepers here? I mean, um, who is making those decisions and what gets translated and published? And that's it. Publishers, publishers are the gatekeepers, aren't they? And um, it, here be, again, it's it's interesting that in some places in Europe, where where there are so many languages at play, there is more access to books in translation. But of course, in the UK. Uh, we, we don't have so many languages at play because, of course, the most important language has got to be English. Yeah. So, so the, the gatekeepers are definitely the publishers, many of whom um, are not prepared to take the risk of uh, making uh, material available in other languages. Uh, and even really well-known poets, fantastic poets, publishing in other language are often surprisingly not available in English translations or bilingual texts. It's almost people uh, just don't consider that it's, um, it's important to have those, the two languages on, on the page, you know, next to each other. So there is a, there is something that's that's holding back uh, publishers in the UK from making available uh, writing in different languages, and of course it's the readers who who lose out or yeah. English readers who lose out. I mean, it'd be great, for example, if we can have more 
if we could have this is the canon translated into more languages because in that way in some ways people could see what they're missing because <laughs> then yeah. I'm sure they will kind of say well look this is a really good we didn't know that this book was available because you know mm. they've only seen it in English why can't we have it in our own language you know I think that's an important step that's hopefully with, with this book as well we know that the publishers have uh, been able to sell the rights in Dutch but let's you know and, and they've kind of recognized that they need to have more of the text that we've got in there also in Dutch that's that would be really great if this could happen with other languages too other languages that are, are used you know across continents and to see that that kind of work done is it would be important what well, shows it can it's change just, yeah. yeah yes yeah but also, um, for example, uh, writers in Arab, Arabic, uh, much work is not translated, even though there are some sort of really renowned writers. And Asiya Jebar, who wrote Children of the New World, which is in This is the Canon, uh, was denied her mother tongue growing up and then dedicated 10 years of her life so that she could write in Arabic. And she described French as the, the booty of war or something like that in terms of how she also had to write in French. And so... A number of phenomenal writers are, are just simply not translated into English still, but they are translated into other European imperial languages. So that sets up a, a different dynamic as well. And there is no Sami writer, for example, translated yet into English, but translated into Greenlander or translated into um, Russian and German. So we're missing out as well with our sort of uh, English uh, prerequisite. So it's still quite a colonial outlook from British it's publishing. Yeah. 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 Um, so is Tony Birch available there? Is he published in the UK? Well, this is the thing. <laughs> he had to send me a copy of The White. <laughs> so I, yes, I'm constantly... Um, asking that of publishers, how is it that a book might come out and perhaps be reviewed in The Guardian because there's a Guardian Australia online um, sister paper? And why is it that we can't create this arc across between what's happening with Indigenous writing in Australia and into Britain? Because I think there is this gatekeeping assumption, misassumption, that, oh, people may not want to read it, oh, it's outside people's sort of zones of, I don't know, understanding, but then everything is. These are works of the imagination as well. And, and so that's my mission. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. So it sounds like publishers are a bit like the curricula around the world. You know, they're lagging behind um, and kind of holding us back in a way. Um, are there any publishers in the UK that are... Um, not solely profit driven. I think the oh. independent ones. Yeah, they, yes. <laughs> so small, indie, small independent one. I mean, when you see there were we had the big five publishers have now gone down to the big four. That okay. could only be to do with you know profit and not thinking about the writer because I just think that that is a terrible thing for for writers overall. But independent writers, a lot of them, which is why they're called radical, and it's not really a radical thing. It's about thinking about the writer and about thinking about you know basically writers want to be read <laughs> you know yeah. sometimes the money is the secondary factor it's a nice factor but it's a secondary factor they want their work to be read that's why they're doing it so when those barriers are, are put up for whatever reason you know it's a real hindrance so um but I, I like working with independent and smaller publishers because I find that they do tend to be very imaginative open the, the, the thing for them is then the distribution is getting that work out there uh, widely enough for for people to read it so yeah yeah Sometimes it's like a collaboration between a large publisher and a smaller publisher to do that and that does happen sometimes so like Hachette who are the you know the, the larger group of Kirkus who've published this book they have been working with Jacaranda Books, which is one of the independent black publishers, a smaller black publisher, to help distribute their work uh, to a wider number. So that that kind of thing, I think, needs to happen more if we're talking around decolonizing publishing. That kind of work really needs to be done a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. Readers can't read something if they don't know it exists or it's not available mm -hmm. to them, and it's sort of um, 
yeah, wrong to make decisions for the reader, you know, what we were, what we're ready for or what we're up for or what we want to read. Um, yeah, and in Australia, um, now sometimes it takes a particular pers person, I think, too, you know, to have their own reasons for doing that or their own um, foresight. There was a publisher in a, a mainstream publishing house here in Australia who put together a very diverse list and, you know, they've gone now to a, um, a smaller, to head up a smaller publishing label. But, um, yeah, that was one individual just selling mm. each of those books around that decision-making table, like why it was so great and why, you know, there's an absence of this in the market was an opportunity, you know, yeah. to a, a space that could be filled with, with these mm. great writers and, and put together, um, yeah, very diverse lists, which then starts something rolling, you know, it starts changing everyone's list. They're like, oh, we don't have any writers of colour on our, our list or we don't have any indig young Indigenous writers on our list and someone it starts up changing. Mm. Yeah. It starts changing education as well. That's what's needed. It's not just like changing the list. It's changing people's um, ideas, changing people's thoughts, changing, you know, educating people in a different way, you know. So that's what that whole thing about that expanding the list is about, is about, is about the education. But well, certainly just, in, in the UK, it's also about having a more, we have to keep using this word, diverse, a more diverse group of people involved in the publishing process. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, if, if we don't have diverse readers within publishing, uh, they're not going to be in a, in a position to recommend books that are diverse so we do need um we do need a, a, a greater awareness uh about who is making the decisions about what to publish uh, and that has not moved considerably uh, where we are in the uk one little uh sort of incremental change though that um, Joan and I are pleased about is that Hachette offer two paid summer internships to students on RMA and Black British Literature annually mm. and that started last year and both of the women that had that experience are now working in publishing. They were able to, because of that experience, uh, then find careers, their chosen career in publishing um, to uh, women of African descent. So that's a very small microscopic uh, example, I suppose. But, yes, it's hopeful. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think yeah. it's a great example because then it, it just drives more and more change. Um, yeah. And I imagine those internships would be very much two-way learning experiences. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. Um, it, it's not always recognised that it is two-way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great example. Um, I was going to ask, and we've talked a lot about, um, you know, everyone wanting to find themselves represented on the page, and um, but we're also, you know, the value of a um, broader range of books available um, to those of us who may not be in the canonical majority. Um, but can we talk a bit more about what a broader range of reading brings the reader, how it benefits everyone. Um, and, you know, these are just stories we're talking about. Uh, so what, what does it bring to the reader? What does it bring to the reader? It, I, I think it brings to the reader a greater understanding of the world and, this is this is urgent. <laughs> it's it's not just an abstraction. It's urgently needed um, for us to understand how we share the world. Right? It's it the 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 ideas that we've learned about sharing the world uh, through much of the established reading practice. Those ideas have not always been healthy. Those ideas have often uh, placed certain kinds of human um, centrally as terribly important and others at a distance. 
And that that is really, it's not served us collectively as humans well for a long time, okay? Hundreds of years. It has not made us um, uh, aware of the, the, the kind of priorities. It's not made us aware of our need to know each other. So it's really important that if this can be an opportunity for us to, to, to get into the heads of a, a range of humans and um, recalibrate what it means to be human, what it means to be human next to other people we, we know less. And we, we can't take much of the learning that, that is considered um, classical maybe, um, that, that, you know, we can't take those colonial forms of knowing and run with them because they have been false. They have been um, bad for us, quite honestly. Yeah, and bad for the planet also. You know? And bad for the planet. We <laughs> yeah. not, yes. We've so things- just, yeah, we've just not um, understood. We've just been miseducated. So if we take the steps to, um, to, to, to set that right at an individual level as much as possible through reading, then that is a huge step uh, in, in terms yeah. of, getting us to a better place where we can communicate with each other. Yeah, no, that's really yeah, no. important. Yeah. yeah, I think it also gives, it shows, it will show readers hopefully that they actually do have some choice and they do, they can, they do have some decision making and what there is available to read and what they can read. And they're not just, not just that they are given what, what you know, the publishers give them. Once they can see the breadth of work, it's like, well, okay, if we have this, then we can have this as well, you know, and they can, and if they realize it's them to make that decision of what they read and not the not just the publisher. Yeah, absolutely. And it can start with an auditing of one's own bookshelf because I don't know how mm. everyone who's perhaps listening groups the books that they have at home <laughs> on their bookshelf or in their office. And why do you group them as you do? And who's overrepresented or underrepresented? Are there things that you think, how did I ever read that? Or uh, things that you have never read that have been on your bookshelf for a long time. So I feel like that's that's an important aspect of it as well, to start, start at home <laughs> and work outwards. I think it's weird you say that because I realise now that I group my fiction books and my non-fiction books and my poetry books, I group them differently. <laughs> <laughs> I, keep my, I keep my poetry books in my bedroom so that I can have the easiest access to them. <laughs> now, isn't that funny? <laughs> like, no, I don't want to have to go far to find them. I want to be able to just get out and take one out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also when you were talking, Inga, about uh, what it is that gets through, I suppose, to our hearts perhaps um, when we're reading, uh, uh, something for, for me as a reader, I must say, I'll, I'll be personalizing it now is when I read Children of the New World I had a number of um, Algerian friends in London in the 80s who were survivors of the revolution and the war there and so to read Asiya Jebar's magnificent novel about this from the perspectives of women um, traditional women and revolutionaries and the way in which they all played such a part in a story that I'd only ever heard of from a very male dominated I suppose recounting that was a complete insight not only into the kinds of literature that were coming out about that experience because our books are not uh, we don't choose these for sort of just solely for history or, or sort of sociological points they are absolutely fabulous literary works as well and, and so there's often an, a wonderful intersection of, of learning on many planes as a reader um, of an experience that you may have had with interactions of people in your life. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think. Um, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say nothing, nothing allows us to, to think from someone else's perspective, to feel from someone else's perspective than a really good story. Like I totally 
appreciate that about the books you've chosen, that they're all um, beautiful literary works, um, strong characters, <laughs> stories that will sweep us away because we have to kind of be swept away and disentangled um, from the lives we've led to really put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And I think that word perspective is so important here. Many of us may have read books that purported to be from someone's perspective, but it wasn't. Mm. It wasn't. It was someone else's perspective imposed in on top. And it's, um, you know, in books that were widely read, it has really shaped generations. Um, mm. Maybe, yeah, the three of you could, um, we haven't had any questions come in. If Maybe you're all afraid we're drowning in questions here. We're not. So if you wanted to lob <laughs> one in, um, it would be lovely. But I would like to hear more about that from the three of you. Um, yeah, that, that importance of perspective and authenticity um, in literary works that are, that are being published and that you'd like to see being read. I'd, I'd like to just pick up on this notion of being swept away <laughs> again, because that that is so important. The the learning and the and the reflection on that uh, comes maybe very slowly afterwards, but it is that being swept away by the narrative that is so important in our reading fiction, which is what the, the focus of this, um, this is the canon is about. And th the impact of that being swept away is so profound that often we, we, we can't get hold of the many things that we are learning at the time. But again, to go back to this point of, you know, what is being human? Who is who is human? Whose experiences of being human are are valued? It, those stories allow us the, intricate stories, but they allow us to reflect in our own time on the importance of all of this. It's different to being told, isn't it? Ah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've probably um, just kind of uh, pulled you away from the question, but I wanted to to pick up on that notion of being swept away. No, it's good. I think it is the the key thing, and um, to be moved by a book, to have your heart broken by a book, um, mm -hmm. it, is to never forget a book or its characters or what you learned on so many levels along the way. Mm. Speaking of learning, did you learn anything from the process of putting this, this book together? You know, did you, did you get some surprises or were you able to surprise each other with some of your selections? I think the surprise was having such a condensed period in which we suddenly had to put it together. <laughs> um, <Yep. laughs> uh, Khadija is a publisher, Joan and I, well, Joan is a publisher too, but Joan and I have done a lot of academic writing where there's a little more sort of flexibility of uh, deadlines, but we were certainly quite hammered and the way in which I think we all had to <laughs> learn to work with that process was, uh, yes, quite an eye-opener. I mean, you've actually told a story yourselves in that you've you've yeah, constructed a narrative of sorts, a, a journey you've taken us on, mm. or for those who haven't read the book yet, a journey that you can look forward to going on. Um, yeah, I, I think you should congratulate yourselves. It, it is a guidebook. Uh, it is a, a wonderful and uh, exciting journey that you've taken us on. And um, it seems to me, yeah, you're very good good guides would you be keen to work together again <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a dangerous question <laughs> I, I want a sequel i want a part <laughs> oh i like I, the I idea in some ways, sequel. <laughs> I, but in some ways I, in some ways i suppose we'd all like to but at the end of the day we we're all multi-project people 
And we could say, oh, yeah, we'd love to do it. But when's the first opportunity we'd have it? We'd probably be 10 years down the line or something. Yeah. That's, I think, is, is kind of the thing. Because, you know, the, the, some of the reasons why we, I would say, were the right people to do this <laughs> is because we are all involved in literature in so many different ways. Uh, not just with reading and not just with teaching, but in mentoring, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's work that we love doing. So this was like an opportune time that we could, act, this could actually get done. You know, um, that time might not even happen. The thing is, yeah. that time might not happen again, no matter how much we'd like to do it. It's just yeah. having that time to do that again is like, would be really difficult, I think. Yeah. I mean, it might be interesting to to revisit it in five or 10 years and see what's changed. Um, we do have an audience question um, from Leo. Thank you for the discussion. Very relatable as a disabled immigrant woman. As a writer slash reader, I've been on this journey for a while. How do you suggest we overcome the gatekeeping by publishers? Mm. Thanks for the question. My thing is have more independent, diverse publishers that's my thing. <laughs> That's what I believe in. And they need to be supported by the readers. Um, you know, not everything is online. Not everything is great online. You know, holding a book is just such a special thing. Um, so, yes, that's that's my way of overcoming some of the gatekeeping. Yes, that, that, is, um, that is a huge question and after a lifetime of trying different ways of overcoming the gatekeeping, even uh, attempting to position myself within the, the, um, the, the kind of uh, gatekeeping, though differently, it is, it is a huge question. It is an enormous question. If you think of writing as um, art, which of course it is, it's, it's an art form, uh, and the ways in which different voices contribute to, to, to this art form. We need, we need to think perhaps of questions around elitism, which in a way has seemed to confer rights on to certain groups as gatekeepers. Maybe what we have to do, those of us who were, were not born um, in the right place and those who are not automatically of that class of people who are um, the, 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 the national gatekeepers, maybe what we ought to do is to keep disrupting. <laughs> uh, really just keep disrupting <laughs> the, 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 you know, what is expected and find different ways of entering the field in order to allow others to come through. So I did that when I became a publisher. I thought, well, you know, um, black folks in the UK are not being let through. Other voices from the Caribbean uh, in different languages are not being let through. Why am I sitting moaning about it? Why don't I do something? <laughs> so, um, so I did. I'm not saying it was it was a major success it, it, and and all of those things. But maybe sometimes I think when we seriously consider overcoming um, that gatekeeping, maybe we also ought to talk to other people who are doing the the creative work and think about invent ways of finding, uh, uh, undermining what uh, really it is. We, we just have to take the matter into our own hands sometimes, but also keep, keep ourselves um, able to join in, find ways to join in the conversation. You know, do what we have, take practical steps, but also um, not cut ourselves off from, from the mainstream, if it's possible. It's a huge, you know, you want the time to do your writing, I know. <laughs> you don't want the time to go and start a new press, I know. <laughs> but sometimes we have to consider all of those options. 
Yeah. No, I think that's a great response. And I mean, for everyone in the audience coming along today to listen was a fantastic step as well to get involved and in, I'm assuming tuning in with a bunch of like-minded people. We're out of time <laughs> despite um, only that one one question but a great question. May I, think- I just, um, Inga, say thank you to Suzanne Olb as the director of the Glen Ira Storytelling Festival because it's quite unique for uh, Joan Khadija and I to be sort of speaking with Australia about our <laughs> Absolutely. And unique and fabulous. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was a great opportunity to speak with the three of you um, and, and to talk about not just the Australian context, but, yeah, a much um, a world context. Um, mm. Thank you for your generosity and your time, Joan, Kardasia, and to Idri. Maybe okay. we'll talk again one day. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I hope so. great. Hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm glad thank we. I'm glad you started it. Thanks you. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks. Have you. a great thank day. You. you. You and too. Bye bye. 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 Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. bye.